it's all very new, relatively new technologies. And I think everyone's still learning how to use them properly, both us and the attackers. From your research, where does it seem to be pointing back to? Is it a person, group, or region for Ember Squid? And since these attackers are running scanners all the time, they got in and they just only had read access, but that was all it took. And these these prices can, you know, get racked up pretty quickly. For every dollar an attacker makes, we estimated it costs fifty three dollars the victim. It's not all about crypto mining. These attackers are looking for any way they can to make money. And there might be more to them than meets the eye. Who says tech can't be human? What's going on, Hacker Valley fam? Welcome back to the show. Let me tell you something amazing about conferences. In-person is so, so much better. During the pandemic, I did what I had to do, and I did the conference circuit virtually, and there's nothing that even gets close to an in-person conference, and I'll tell you why. My podcast guest for today, I met at Black Hat this year. We only had a chance to speak for maybe about 20 minutes, but because of this meeting, I now have a friend and a guest for the show. My guest this episode is Michael Clark. Michael is the Director of Threat Research at Sysdig. Michael, before we met and did this podcast, you were telling me how relentless adversaries are, especially when there's monetary gain. And I can't wait to jump into all of that. But most importantly, Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, it was a lot of fun meeting you at Black Hat. I think that's the most formal interview I ever had with fancy cameras and things. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yes, formal interview number two starts here. So let's first and foremost talk about you. You are the Director of Threat Research at Sysdig. What all does the title Director of Threat Research come with? It comes with quite a few uh, responsibilities, actually. So we do all of our detection engineering, or that's a fancy term for rule writing for our product, but we're also responsible for going out there and finding what the next attacks are going to be, who's doing them, uh, and then, you know, publishing them to get the word out and, you know, making interesting content for people to read. So on the one hand, one side's very technical, the other side's very investigative. So it ends up being a lot of fun because you get to do a little bit of both in the role. I bet. There is a lot of people that watch the show that ultimately want to get to the director level and above. That's where you're at uh, for threat research. What was the path that you had to take to ultimately get into the role that you're in today? So as my path was like long and winding to get here, but I would kind of emphasize getting getting your hands dirty. So that means, you know, making tools to go find bad things on the Internet. Um making rules, looking, uh, doing incident response is another great example. That is part of like core threat research is, is incident response work because you're doing a lot of investigations. And just, you know, you can't always be using like vendor tools, being able to create your own tools always kind of furthers you along that path. But, and it helps you understand how the attackers work. Because once you start understanding how they make their tools, it's like the next step is understanding, you know. So let's crack open that can of worms. You share and publish your research through Sysdig. One of the findings that we were speaking about right before we hit record on the podcast was Amber Squid. Tell us a little bit about Amber Squid. How did you find them? What have you observed? And what is Amber Squid's activity? So we found Amber Squid uh, through one of our data collection methods. So Data collection is a big part of threat research because you need to have data to look through and report on. And one of the things we do is look at containers going through public repositories like Docker Hub. And we have a whole bunch of automated tooling uh, built around this because there's way too much information to look at every single one um, as it comes in. There's millions and millions of these images. So we have tooling that brings interesting ones to our attention. And this one uh, definitely got brought to our attention because it was doing a lot of strange AWS activities. And kind of what we found as we looked into it is we found this container image that had a bunch of scripts on it. And these scripts all created 
a whole bunch of variety of Amazon services that we weren't f very familiar with to start out with. We, we ended up, you know, the rabbit hole ends up going deep, especially with crypto uh, mining base threats. And that was the end goal here was, was crypto mining. These guys decided that they didn't want to use EC, EC2 to do mining. They wanted to use pretty much everything but EC2. So we, saw, we started seeing them uh, spin up, you know, Fargate instances, which is, you know, containers as a service, Amplify, uh, CodeBuild, SageMaker, all these other AWS services to do the mining instead. And this ends up being, you know, it's a little slower, like you can't spin up a, a huge EC2 box in these services with like 10 processors or, you know, whatever the really expensive ones are. But on the other hand, no one's looking at them either. So this was definitely something we hadn't seen before. This is interesting because it reminds me of a, a passive income scheme. Like we all love passive income. And the whole purpose of passive income is to keep that income source as low maintenance and just easy to keep and maintain. That's kind of what this sounds like, but from an attacker's perspective. There's a lot of money to be made out there with uh, crypto miners. I would not expect someone to use SageMaker or Amplify. I love Amplify. I'm not monitoring it for uh, crypto miners, uh, but I would imagine that maybe there's money to be made. Is that money significant? Is there a lot of money to be made on AWS services like Amplify and SageMaker? I think it's all relative to where you live. Um, there isn't a, a lot of money if you're considering, if you like live in the United States, unless you achieve massive scale. Uh, but at lower cost living areas, you could make a, a few hundred dollars a week uh, easy doing this. And how you get the credentials is another thing. So there's always a, a cost element to this. Now, if you're stealing credentials, that cost could be zero, or you could be buying compromised credentials off the dark web. Um, so it, it ends up being really a, a business kind of decision. Uh, and there's also another element to kind of put in here, and this is crypto mining in general, is the risk element. I mean, these are illegal activities. You're compromising accounts, running malicious code, but is someone going to come after you for abusing you know, a SageMaker instance? Is, are the authorities going to come knocking at your door? Probably not. But if you compare that to like a ransomware incident where, you know, you take down a, a large company or even a healthcare company or some other, you know, critical company, the odds of uh, the risk goes way up with, you know, authorities coming to find you. So there's that proposition you have to put in the formula, too. So I think you're absolutely correct in the passive income sense. I would imagine that part of the equation here is the services that Amber Squid is taking advantage of. Uh, security teams, IT teams, they're not monitoring these services for um, crypto miners. So when you think about SageMaker, Amplify, and any other service like that, is it feasible for an organization to monitor all their AWS services? And is there a way to monitor this in an effective way? So we did look at that as part of the research as to what logging would tell you. Now, if you're not using these services, and you could probably create some log logging to tell you, hey, you know, this is a new service you've never used. Um, that's easy to kind of see. But if you are using the services, most of what's available in CloudTrail will not give you much specific information. Now, I think it's SageMaker that will tell you the command being run. I might have the services confused, but and another one will give you the base 64 encoded command, but the others will not give you any uh, anything in the cloud trail. So you have to know that something's wrong and then go investigate further. What about the way that someone gains access? How does that typically take place? Is that due to misconfigurations from someone like Amber Squid or is there other attack factors there? For Amber Squid, we're not totally sure because we found basically their source code. Uh, but it looks like they just use credentials. So you just plug in credentials and it goes from there. There is no associated exploit with it or any of that kind of code. Now, it doesn't mean that they couldn't be getting the credentials from exploits are running elsewhere, or like I mentioned earlier, buying the credentials off of the dark web or, you know, misconfigurations or taking care, taking advantage of free trial systems uh, that give them temporary credentials. 
there are many different ways to abuse these cloud service providers. When it comes to being a defender, I'm ultimately the one responsible. I'm responsible for securing containers, my cloud infrastructure, and other things like SageMaker, for instance. Let's say I'm investigating um, some weirdness. I see that commands are being run via SageMaker that they normally wouldn't be run in. Uh, what would I do as a practitioner to investigate and potentially get rid of an adversary if I did find them in one of those services? You'd have to rely on CloudTrail for the most part. So luckily, CloudTrail does give things like the IP address they're coming from. And most often, that's kind of the easiest way to see you know, what's normal and what's not. Um, now, there's always the very advanced attacker that you know, using a VPN to the right spot to make it confusing. But most of these attackers don't you know, take that kind of expense on. They just you know, get mine what they can. And if they get kicked out, they get kicked out. No big deal. They just uh, keep looking for something else. So you have to employ these other technologies outside of FileTrail that mainly take in the CloudTrail logs and do all the easier behavior. Now, doing like forensic response in the cloud is always a challenge because you don't you don't actually get all the true forensic artifacts. Now, in some cases, you can download the notebook that they made, like the Jup if they spin up a, a Jupyter notebook for SageMaker, you might be able to download that notebook and then you know see what commands they ran and, and what they did and everything. But for other applications, that's just not you know really feasible. So it definitely challenges in the cloud for for responding to these incidents. When I was working as a detection engineer, there was a lot of different tools that we would have to use to automate information. And there were still a lot of touch points. I, a lot of the cases, I would have to log into eight different tools and a spreadsheet and log into Slack um, just to kind of make sense out of all this information. And I know that we need speed as security practitioners because the adversary is taking advantage and exploiting speed. Uh, what has been your finding for a group like Amber Squid when it comes to speed? Is their speed even faster? And is that just specific to container-based threats? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's all very quick. And that's really why we love the cloud. But, you know, that can also be used against us. Like, it's very quick to spin up an EC2 instance. I think it's like a minute or two to have it all fully up and going. Uh, but this also kind of works against us. So... Like Amber Squid can spin up all these services really quickly. And, you know, we studied these attacks in the cloud and found that, you know, in under 10 minutes, the whole attack chain is, is usually completed, whether that's installing the crypto mine, getting access through installing the crypto miner or, you know, downloading data or pivoting another account or whatever the impact is, you know, it's over in 10 minutes. So you have to find out about these things really quickly if you want to respond in time. One downside with cloud too is everything's very atomic. You get one event that says an EC2 instance was created or a SageMaker was created. On its own, that may not be uh, malicious. You have to start correlating it with the other account and then with data you know about the user or the IP address. And then you have to come up with some sort of uh, verdict on is this malicious or not? and then what to do about it. Now, the positive side on this is the what to do about it. Since it's all APIs and cloud, if you're, depending on your risk tolerance, you could shut things down automatically or adjust user's permission automatically. So there are a lot of options that you could uh, potentially use. Alerting is always a key. And I know there's a lot of alerts also when it comes to the billing uh, aspect of AWS. Maybe you could alert on a major spike if you were to see that, and that might give you some clues and context. One of the other things that you were mentioning uh, earlier was Amber Squid is focused on free services. Uh, what kind of free services have been out there that Amber Squid has leveraged, and what are some of the risks that they've exploited on that side? Yeah, so this is what we call free jacking. Uh, and we, we kind of started with this in uh, an operation we call Purple Urchin. Last year, um, we basically found this attacker who was going crazy abusing all these free services. And, you know, they can use any anywhere they can get compute access. They can almost run a miner. So that could be all these like free uh, virtual service, virtual providers out there that offer a free tier. Um, GitLab, GitHub offer actions. That's That's free compute. You can run 
We've seen them run miners in that. And there are dozens and dozens of these other providers who just, you know, offer um, free ways to run applications. So these all can be abused by these free jackers. One of the more creative ones we saw was that they will go through multiple steps. So we've seen attackers like get a Coursera account and some Coursera courses give you free access to like GCP. They'll give you a free trial to GCP without going through all the typical safeguards if you go directly to GCP to get a free trial. And so they'll use that to, they'll sign up for a course, then use that access to run a miner. And they'll automate all of this. CAPTCHAs, they'll have built-in CAPTCHA solvers. Um, coming up with fake names, fake looking credit cards, fake email addresses, fake domain names. They'll all have that automated uh, so they can you know, pivot to a new domain name um, when they feel like there's been burned. Uh, they really use all the, and they use all these DevOps practices that we've all been learning and doing, to do the same things. Like they'll use GitHub Actions to build their infrastructure. Um, it's all about efficiency and making the most money for a little mouse time as possible. So it's really interesting to see the evolution. I can only imagine trying to build a service and offer part of it for free and then getting caught up with something like free jacking and hit with a huge bill. One of the things that I would do if I were hit with a big bill from AWS that I did not create for myself is I would reach out to AWS, GCP, really whoever is my cloud provider, and I would ask for forgiveness. Is that something that organizations do? Uh, have you heard any stories or have any experiences there? Yes. I mean, they definitely have been very forgiving, but you know, with the economy the way it is and profitability being um, a big driver now, it's unclear if this forgiving policy will continue forever. I mean, it's kind of part of the shared responsibility model, but they are, I expect them to put more you know, safeguards on their side. Be like, look, if you're running insecure things, we're not going to forgive it. But if it's, you know, if you meet these qualifications in your account, things are set up in a reasonable way, maybe we will. But it's all unclear kind of how that will happen. And these, these prices can, you know, get racked up pretty quickly. For every dollar an attacker makes, we estimated it costs fifty three dollars to the victim, because you know the cloud was never meant for crypto mining. Um, it's just not a very efficient way to do it, because you know GPUs and even like CPUs on the hardware are much more efficient than spinning up an e a cloud instance. And it just ends up costing the victim so much more than the attacker makes, but the attacker doesn't care. So it's not their bill. So they are uh, perfectly okay with that inefficient way. But if they scale that up, they can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars very quickly, especially if there's no limits on the account for how much they can scale. Like they'll just do as much as they can as quick as they can. Right. I'm sure it's difficult to, you know, provide attribution to a specific person, group, or even region. From your research, where does it seem to be pointing back to? Is it a person, group, or region for Amber Squid? For the Ones we've tracked, it all seems to come back to Indonesia, surprisingly. They have a thriving crypto community, uh, both legitimate and not so. But we've did, you know, we found the Indonesian language in scripts and naming and other things. So I obviously can't say 100% sure, but that's our, our best guess as far as attribution. But with cost of living differences, it, it kind of makes sense. But they're very advanced on know, this, especially free jacking front of using free trials and automating it all as much as possible. I want to take a second and pull out my magical crystal ball and look into the future. Where do you see the threats and threat landscape going from a container security perspective over the next one to two years? Well, I think we'll continue to see adoption uh, increase um, as people learn to use it more. Everyone's still learning. It's all very new, relatively new technologies. And I think everyone's still learning how to use them properly, both us and the attackers. Uh, supply chain is, you know, always gaining in popularity and container images are a perfect place to uh, put malicious code. If you can get somebody to uh, deploy it on their infrastructure, then you kind of get free access to their infrastructure. 
And we, we talk about crypto mining a lot, but you know this isn't all limited to crypto mining. Uh, these attackers, even if they install a crypto miner, will steal other things that they can from your S3 if they get access, from your lambdas or functions as uh, functions as a service. Those are often easily downloadable if you have read access. Uh, so they will take everything they can and might still leave a crypto miner behind. That's either like a smoke screen or, you know, maybe they just want to make some money in case they don't find anything. These attackers are looking for any way they can to make money. And there might be more to them than meets the eye. Uh, so it's, it's very easy to dismiss this as nuisance malware or just crypto miners. But there's definitely more going on. Yeah, it's always evolving. And it seems like now that there is cloud and SaaS that the access to tools and solutions like this has become a necessity for collaboration and productivity. A lot of our audience wants to promote that, but they want to reduce the exposures to risks. Uh, for anyone out there that's listening right now that wants to get one step better at protecting their cloud, especially when looking at their containers, what would your one piece of advice be for them? I would say, you know, start with the simplest thing. And I shouldn't say simplest, but like secrets management is still very crucial, uh, especially with the cloud, because it's all identity based. So managing your secrets that, you know, if they get leaked, they'll lead to identity based compromises. And that's where all these things kind of go wrong. And, and as part of secrets management, you know, definitely include like permissions management. Over permissioning is one of the leading causes of all of. Uh, these sorts of things. So ensuring that your accounts are permissioned properly, if they don't need to create EC2 instances, they shouldn't. Um, they don't need read access to a, a service, they shouldn't have it. So getting all of that under control, and there's plenty of tools to do that. It's options are like CSPM, make sure everything's configured correctly. You have to do all the basics before you can uh, get into the more advanced topics like runtime threat detection and all these more advanced things that you need to have people who can look at it. But, you know, once you are, once you do those, you should be on a solid footing to move on to the next steps of maturity. Love that. Start with the foundations and then build out from there. There's a lot of great information out there already. And I'm going to drop some of your research into the show notes, Michael, for everyone to stay up to date with what you're doing at Sysdig. Also, for anyone that wants to stay up to date with Michael, be sure to check out the show notes or description wherever you're listening or watching where I've dropped a link to his social accounts for you to connect with Michael. Uh, wanted to say thank you to you, Michael, for taking some time out of your busy day to jump on the ones and twos and speak to our audience. And with that, we will see everyone next time.